<laughs> Hello my loves and welcome back to Strange Playgrounds. Welcome to one of the very, very, very few subjects that I never spoke about in any of my Clive Barker retrospectives, apart from just to reference it disparagingly. And that is uh, the video game, Clive Barker's Jericho. Uh, Jericho was Clive Barker's probably most high-profile foray into video games. I mean, Undying was pretty... Undying did well, but it wasn't that high-profile. It was very niche, because, largely because of its platform more than anything else. I mean, it came out on the PC at a time when games like Undying were kind of ten a penny. I mean, I love Undying. I think Undying is a really interesting piece of work. But it didn't really make much of a splash because it was compared unfavorably to... Similar first-person games, games like Deus Ex, like Half-Life, and Unreal, and so on and so forth. All of which were superior on a technical level to Undying. Um, which is a kind of a shame, because there's some, there's some great notes of mythology in Undying. There are some moments of horror that are really interesting, some great mechanics. Jericho was quite high-profile. It, it, it came about at the beginning of the... Of uh, the particular generation um, signified by the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. It was supposed to be sort of like a flagship game for the Xbox 360 alongside a PC port, which did not do very well at all. I mean, the PC port of Jericho is atrocious. It's a, it's a phenomenally lazy port, as a lot of ports from the Xbox 360 to the PC were, to the point whereby... It's one of those games, it's from an era where quick time events were still very much a thing. Everybody hates fucking quick time events. Nobody likes quick time events. And the port is so damn lazy that when the quick time events occur in the PC version, the buttons that flash up on the screen that tell you what you've got to press are the Xbox buttons. That's how freaking lazy that port is. It is a very, very bad port indeed, and not very fun to play at all. Now, Jericho... Jericho was really well publicized. It was kind of a big deal. It was going to be like this first-person horror game that, was, that had Clive Barker's name attached to it. It was supposed to be a big deal. It was a flagship game for the Xbox 360. It carried a certain amount of weight in and of itself. It was also going to drop at a time when, frankly, horror video games were in the toilet. There was just very little out there that was any good. This was sometime, I believe, before the likes of Dead Space for example, which would be one of the markers of horror in that era. It would certainly be one of the franchises that dominated the horror scene during that console generation. This was going to be one of those games that kind of set the standard for the Xbox 360 and for the, the console generation. Unfortunately, the game itself is just not that good. In fact, it's... The game, the technical element of it, is frustrating to the nth degree, and the only reason I've played it through once, and once only, is because it has Clive Barker's name attached to it, and because it has some really interesting... that The stuff that Clive contributed is really good. So, the mythology, for example, is superb. The story is fantastic. The characters are good. The setting is wonderful. The visuals, some of the visuals in this game are repulsively brilliant. And I mean absolutely incredible. It has one of the characters I would love to see more of, which is Arnold Leach. Arnold Leach is kind of one of the antagonists of this game. And he's essentially an occultist, not a satanic occultist as such. He's just a dark occultist. He uses dark magic and dark rituals to affect very unpleasant things in the world. And as a result of his, his experiences, he's become basically a Cenobite. When he does physically appear in the game, he is like he's been warped and transformed and mutilated to the point whereby he is like this inverse angel. He is absolutely beautiful. I would definitely recommend going and looking up 
videos and images of Arnold Leach. He's got wings that are made of like metal frames with the flayed skin of his back stretched from them. He's an amazing creature, and I would have loved to have seen more of him. Love to have seen, and the rest of the the characters, the cast actually, the cast of Jericho are generally very, very good, and they've got suggested backstories that sadly aren't really explored that much in the game, um, and that's largely due to the, the the bizarre and problematic format of the game itself. So the game is a, in technical terms, it's a first person horror shooter, right? And it's it's the most bizarre decision I've ever come across. It has some of the most beautiful aesthetics and levels I have ever seen. Some of the most astounding environments that were existed in a video game at the time. But it's on rails. It's a rail shooter. Meaning that you can't really explore very much. There are, within the levels and within the rail system, the linear path, there are certain areas where you can sort of go off the beaten path, but not very far. And as a result, it's this strange one-track experience. You play the Jericho squad, who are effectively a... They are a paramilitary team whose business is to respond to occult phenomena. They are all, to a one, they are this ragtag bunch of misfits and deviants. They are blood witches. They are possessees. They are, there's one of the characters, he's a guy who's actually possessed by a fire demon. He's got a fire demon bound into his arm. And his arm, as you play as him, he's got this metal cage around his arm. And if you... If you unleash it, the fire demon streams out and attacks his enemies. Uh, necromancers, sorcerers, psychics, telekinetics. Basically people who have had some kind of occult trauma or paranormal trauma. They are the people who make up the Jericho squad. They're, they're actually, by all accounts, they have a long and sordid history. They were set up originally to respond to Nazi paranormal and occult threats, but since that time have expanded to respond to occult threats from across the, the face of the world. And the game actually begins with Arnold Leach. Arnold Leach is called to by a creature by an entity known as the Firstborn. And the Firstborn, this is such a Barkerian concept, it is absolutely wonderful. The Firstborn is one of the most amazing things in the game. The Firstborn is the first creation of God. Uh, according to the mythology of this game, God created an entity before he created humanity, which is a perfect being. It is androgyne, it is sexless, it is without definition, and it is perfect. It is actually so perfect, so astounding that it disturbed God, apparently, and he was actually unhappy with what he created, and so he sealed it away. He sealed it away for fear of what it could do. For fear that it might be the equal of him, effectively. He sealed it in like a sub-dimension. You couldn't destroy it. It's completely immortal. So he sealed it away in a sub-dimension called the Box. And over time, the Firstborn has regained its sapience and has called out from the Box to certain resonant and sympathetic souls and drawn them into the box and so over time different parts of history and culture and the world have collapsed into the sub-dimension of the box so it is now this strange tempestual paradox of different of clashing eras where those who have been contacted by the firstborn have been slowly driven mad together and have become monsters they become distorted Barkerian parodies of themselves. So some of the areas you want through are like ancient Rome, for example. One of the, the best boss encounters in the game is with a, um, a Roman emperor, effectively, who is this swollen grotesque whose body splits apart and sprays effluent all over you. The, one of the latter levels is ancient Sumeria, a portion of ancient Sumeria, where the the main enemies are a uh, it's a sextet of Sumerian priests who were originally responsible for binding the firstborn. It's a really cool concept. The settings, as you would imagine, are 
gorgeous. And the Firstborn itself appears throughout the game. It appears as like a... Almost like a fetal, like a child, but with fetal elements. It's a bit like how the Jaff is described in the Great and Secret show, actually. But its skin is black, like shadow, like a laginous. And it appears to you throughout the game and guides you along. The Jericho team are dispatched because Leech is going to unleash it. Basically, after he is contacted by the Firstborn, he he's originally part of the Jericho team, and he goes, he defects from the team and becomes this wild raving occultist guy who then spends the next several decades causing occult calamity and horror affecting atrocity across the world as a way of weakening the the bindings of the box so that he can unleash the firstborn on the world that's his entire agenda and it looks like he's going to succeed. That's the that's why the Jericho team are dispatched to, to stop him. They arrive at where they believe the entrance to the box is located, which is in the Rabal Kali, the desert which uh, Shadwell crosses in um, in Weave World. And they actually find the lost city of Alkali, which is apparently where the entrance to the box is. However, the main character is is killed. One of the more interesting elements of this story, one of the more interesting twists, is that the main character dies really early on in the game in combat with Leech's uh, occult servants and monsters. But he becomes a ghost. So you play the ghost effectively, and what he can do is possess different characters from the Jericho team as you go along and you can use their different abilities and different weapons and whatnot to fight different types of monster to solve different puzzles great concepts right i mean this is the kind of thing that hadn't ever really been done in a first person game before to be co to be controlling a team all with different abilities being able to switch between them as this possessing entity brilliant idea awesome concepts unfortunately Beyond the aesthetics, beyond the mythology, beyond the storyline and the characters, the game itself, like the raw technicals of the game, are just not very good, unfortunately. What they've done with that mechanic, with the, the possession mechanic, the, controlling the team, they've over-egged the pudding. So every character is... Not only do they have occult abilities that can be upgraded and changed and, and shifted out depending on what you what you find and what you discover in the game, they also have more common weapons. Like some of them will be equipped with grenade launchers, some of them are equipped with swords, some of them are equipped with machine guns, and each of these guns has different types of ammunition. You can see what's happening now. Not only is the gameplay really complex because you've got to switch between the different characters, which means that the control pad is quite complex already but you've also got a control system whereby you've got to switch between the paranormal abilities the different types of paranormal abilities the different ammunitions the weapons it's confusing it's ham-fisted to the nth degree and the worst of it is you need certain characters alive to solve certain puzzles in the game if they're not alive you're screwed you're done. So you you find yourself embroiled in these situations where enemies are coming at you from every direction. You can't really tell where they're coming from. They endlessly spawn and you are wildly trying to find the right button configuration to switch between this character, this character or this character. So you, And then to switch between the ammunition types and the weapons so you can solve the damn puzzle or kill the damn enemy. Before lo, Long, long, long after the appeal of the mythology and the aesthetics has worn off, the game becomes tooth-grindingly irritating. On top of that, the game throws in a lot of stuff which is... It's redolent of the era, effectively. One of the... And it's, it's baffling to me. It was baffling to me at the time. Nobody liked them. Nobody likes them now. It's why they've gone the way of the dodo. Fucking quick-time events. The game is rife with instant death quick time events and these aren't even like the kinds of quick time events that you find in say Resident Evil 4 which is a contemporary of this game um which are still bad but at least they you, they're not at least they're not so irritating that you can't overcome them 
The ones in Jericho are so quick, they come out of nowhere with no warning. The buttons flash up so briefly on the screen that you you could there's hard, you most of the time the only reason you do you you actually succeed is by luck it's by mashing the buttons and hoping that you get through if you're playing the pc version good luck good luck because it's going to throw the xbox controls at you and not the buttons on the pc it is horrifically bad and of course when you die as you inevitably will to the quick time events you are hurtled back to a predetermined checkpoint where you have to wade through loads of enemies again and you've got to go and do very frustrating puzzles while you're being attacked and so on and so forth it's tooth grindingly annoying this game there's not much to recommend it on a technical level and it's sad because the ambition is really high a lot of it could have been solved if they got rid of that rail system. I don't know why anyone making a first person game at that time, in that era, would decide, oh, let's put this on rails. It makes no sense, especially given how amazing these environments are. I spoke earlier about the environments that have been drawn into the Rub Al Kali and sort of mashed together in these contradictory melanges, these collages of different eras, not only have they been mashed together, they've been corrupted over time, they've been transformed by the influence of the firstborn, by the dark forces that have seeped into the box or that have arisen there, so there is so much to see here. There's so much interesting environmental detail to admire and to take in, but you don't have the time to do it because the game is just sifting you along. It's carrying you, al carrying you along on the rails and throwing monsters at you from left, right and centre. It's very formulaic. The structure of the game is phenomenally formulaic. It's basically story element, hordes of enemies, few puzzles, story, hordes of enemies, few puzzles, story, and it just keeps going on like that until the final encounter with the firstborn. And the story is good. The story is really interesting. The characters are interesting. The firstborn is not an unambiguous character. It's marketed as like this ultimate evil like beyond satan this thing this is like satan cowers in fear from this thing god cowers in fear from this thing but it is not unambiguous it is a prisoner you know it is it is an abused child it was treated badly by its creator don't we know that story so there is some like commonality between the firstborn and humanity right and if anything it casts god as the bad guy which is a classically barkerian thing um it's just that the story is married to a game that is so phenomenally irritating that nobody really liked it at the time. It did. It reviewed very badly, very badly, and has since gone down in history as being one of the one of the great clangers, unfortunately, of that era. It is not a well remembered game, and it's a real shame. Because there's great stuff in it. The good stuff comes from Barker, as you might imagine. You can so see this mythology, just like Undying, just like Undying, you can see this mythology becoming the basis for something much bigger. I mean, there's almost like a, a comic book element to the Jericho Squad already. There's all sorts of implied backstory between the characters, their relationships, their histories, all of them are damaged people. All of them have had traumas inflicted on them that have led them to being recruited by the Jericho squad. And those traumas do come into play in the game, in the story as well. It is really fascinating. But because of the nature of the game, there's no real chance to explore in any great detail what those backstories are. It's a phenomenal missed opportunity. But you could see, if, if the game had been good, if the game had succeeded, you can definitely see how not only would there have been sequels, but there would have been other media, short stories, comics. This is a comic book mythology, a dark comic book mythology that could have been sensational. Absolutely sensational. It's just that it wasn't popular enough to warrant one or to warrant any kind of continuation of any format or medium at all.
And it's a grand shame because you can see how this game could have been amazing. The, the background, the imagery, stuff we haven't really seen in video games before. I would it will never happen, not in a million years, because this game has tainted its own franchise so powerfully. But if you could take the mythology and the imagery and the characters and, tr and do a remake of Jericho, do something like a proper first-person game that's not on rails, that allows you to explore... Oh, this could, like a first-person RPG slash shooter, this could have been amazing. It could potentially still be amazing, but there's not a chance in hell. And I doubt very much Barker will return to this mythology anytime soon, unfortunately. Because I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm fairly certain that the failure of it left a bit of a sour taste in his mouth. I don't think, I mean, given the undying... Undying didn't do very well either, and that's a great shame because Undying is a good game. Undying is a very good game, so that is even more of a shame. I have a feeling he probably won't, won't be returning to video games for quite a while. It's a real shame. A real shame. If indeed he ever does, maybe he never will. I live in hope. I live in hope. I mean, you know, we've actually started seeing, arguably for the first time ever... Writers having some like like writers of literature and fiction having some marginal success in video games recently. I mean, look at arguably the most successful foray of a mainstream writer into video games recently. It's got to be George R. R. Martin with Elden Ring, right? It's got to be. I mean, okay, his input was limited, but it's there at least, and it's a very successful piece. Barker has. I mean, Barker's one of those imaginations where. He has the potential to create something that that we'd never seen before in the format, in the medium. Uh, there's there's so mine. There's so many great little kitchen sink teams out there, independent teams who could be doing great work with Barker's material. But it just seems that he he has a horrible tendency of being married to uh, studios and teams that don't really understand what they're doing on one level or another. I mean, with Undying, actually, the team did really well. The game is good. It's just the marketing was terrible. The marketing was absolutely appalling for, for Clive Barker's Undying. And it deserved to be a much better game than it was. It deserved to be... A, not, rather, it deserved to be a much bigger game than it was. But the marketing was terrible. Jericho, mar great marketing, but the game is bad. The technicals are bad. Uh, it's, it's, it's like you can't win. It's so sad. There's still such potential here. There is still such potential for Barker to do something amazing in video games. But whether it will ever happen now, who knows. I think the most we can ever expect is for maybe someone else, a studio to adapt one of his works into a video game format. Um, whether that will ever happen, whether it can happen, who knows? But let's hope and pray, eh?